Welcome to Turning the Tables Healthy Cooking class. This is a project of Cornell Cooperative Extension Ulster County, the Ellenville Regional Rural Health Network, and Stick to Local Studio. I'm Maria Reidelbach. Hi, um, here we are at Fiddlehead Farm on a beautiful November day. This is farmer Bob Fade, and he's going to show us what's growing and not growing in November on the farm. So what's going on here? Well, this is our okra, and okra is one of the many things that doesn't like the cold. So the frost uh, just knocked this right out and killed it immediately. Like the next day, the leaves all drop, and anything that was left is no good anymore. So it happens instantly? Yeah, it's really, as soon as, as, soon as it thaws, it's dead. The cells inside the leaves and the plant itself just kind of burst when they freeze, and once it thaws out, all the, the everything leaks out of the cells, and they're they're dead. So why does that happen to some plants and not other plants? It's traditionally the the warm weather crops like um, uh, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, okra. They just can't stand uh, uh, any sort of frost. But the cooler weather stuff, I guess, was developed to handle it prefers the cooler weather to grow in and it can handle quite a few frosts we still have a, a good bit of broccoli still living and growing making little buds we have escarole all of the greens all the cool weather crops are really still going um, we have arugula mizuna cabbage is still going kale bok choy we have some dandelion greens uh tot soy more broccoli uh, radishes are still growing, leaf lettuce. And this looks like arugula. Yes, this is a, it's an older planting of arugula, and this is one we've harvested once or twice already. We have some tot soy as a uh, mizuna. Oh, that mizuna looks good. Yeah, they'll stand a few more frosts before there's any problems with them. Mizuna's in the cabbage family, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a mustard. Technically, it's a mustard. And so is arugula? Um, I'm not sure. I think arugula is, is a, a brassica. Yeah. Yeah. So all of these are really. So I guess they just really all like yeah, every, everything the cold weather. Is, yeah, everything ends up going back to being a brassica, I guess, you know. Yeah. These are winter radishes. This is daikon and this is a this is a later planting. So the daikon is doing really well, but the uh, the other winter is uh, radishes. Oh, this is such a pretty leaf. Look at that. It doesn't look like an ordinary radish leaf. Yeah. We can I can, if you want me I can pull one out if you want. Oh, it's yeah. Awesome. <laughs> That's fabulous. <laughs> and it just pulls right out. Yeah, well, they, they actually grow, they kind of pop out. So some of the bigger ones end up being like six, eight inches out of the ground, the tops. Wow. Yeah, Let's really get a look time. at these. These are really interesting. So tell me again about these. This is a variety called Merlot. It's a Chinese cabbage that. Uh, these we've had in the ground for a really long time, but they didn't, we didn't get the bigger heads like you normally do with the Napa. And I'm not exactly sure why. Interesting. So sometimes they don't grow the way you intend for them sometimes, to. Sometimes, yeah, a lot of things end up like that. Oh, look at these, kohlrabi. My mom used to grow this. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a, a vegetable that people either love or they've never heard of. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and it, this it's is well um, this is a winter storage variety. So these get larger than normal, and um, we'll harvest them in the next few days and keep them in the uh, the cooler all winter, really. And here's some purple kohlrabi, which is so beautiful. I think it's white inside too, isn't it, Bob? Yeah. Ooh, these are pretty. Yeah, this is our fall fennel, um, and you can see it's starting to suffer a little bit from the cold. You know, they're, they're starting to droop and change colors. Yeah, the bulbs are still fine, but uh, most of this has been harvested, and what's left here is we're too small, really, at the time. Ooh, um, it still tastes really sweet. Oh, glad to hear it. I love this vegetable. This celery root, yeah, it's, it's another unusual one that people aren't that familiar with but uh, it stores very well all winter long and it's got a great celery flavor and a lot of crunch. Wow, these are amazing, now, the beautiful chard. Swiss chard loves the cold. This is one of the problems we've had with the warmer, win uh, warmer weather is the bugs are still kind of active and they, uh, they love Swiss chard as much as everyone does. But we're in a greenhouse. And yet it's cold in here? Yeah, so the way these work in the winter for winter growing is 
um, at nighttime, the temperatures get the same as they are outside. During the day, it gets very warm in here and it heats up the ground. And then we take agricultural fabric at night and we cover the entire ground of the tunnels. And sometimes with two or three layers, depending on how cold it is at night. And the fabric kind of sits as close to the plants as we can get it. And the heat, heat radiates out of the ground and the fabric kind of is like a blanket and keeps the heat really close to the plants. Wow, so you like tuck all these plants in every night? Yeah, well, under we have a blankie? We haven't had to do it yet, but yes. <laughs> That's so sweet. Yeah, no, it's a really great system. And wow. this ground almost never freezes in the winter. It, it works remarkably well. Isn't that something? And what's this here? This is, uh, these are collards. Oh, collards, yeah. yum. Yeah. And we have uh, more of the same cold hardy stuff in there. It's the lettuce, arugula, spinach. They call it the Persephone period in this type of growing. And in this area, it's from November 10th uh, November 10th to February 1st and basically that's when there's less than 10 hours of daylight and when that happens most plants shut down and don't do much growing oh. so we just kind of have to get to the beginning of February and then things start kicking back into gear again I see so in the dead of winter things don't really grow because there's not enough light right? yeah not really some things do like spinach and arugula and mizuna they'll put on a little growth the kale not so much the chard not so much interesting basically winter growing is a matter of getting it to the size you want and sort of just storing it in the tunnel for the winter. It's kind of like keeping them in a refrigerator, but alive. Wow. Yeah. So, and then, but then as the days get a little longer um, and the, we get more daylight, they'll start putting on growth again, or really around mid-February. Bob, this is like Kale City. Yeah, the kale loves the, the winter. It really does. This is called Siberian kale. It's a variety most people aren't familiar with, but it quickly becomes everyone's favorite. And it tolerates the cold like none of the others do. Because it's from Siberia? I, I don't know if it is from Siberia or uh, they named it Siberian because oh. it tolerated the cold so well. Oh, it's so sweet. Yeah, it's really nice. Everything in the winter, honestly, is a lot sweeter because to protect from freezing, a lot of the starches get turned to sugars and it's like an antifreeze. Get out. Yeah, so if you have carrots, some people grow carrots in the winter and they're very sweet. We've done hackerai turnips that are almost like candy. They're unbelievably sweet. Wow. Yeah, because it, that's how they stay from freezing. Bob, if you could share something about farming that you would really like people to know, what would, what, what would you like people to know? What people don't realize often is that it's, it's very complex. There's a lot to it. There's a lot of different layers of of, of how things grow, the fertilizer selection, when you apply it, when you plant everything. It's, a, it's very complex. It's almost like a science. It's not really like the old... People have an impression of like a guy behind a you know, a horse like just plowing a field, but it's really... There's a lot to it. There's a lot of science. I do a lot of spreadsheets. I do a lot of analyzation. Um, and I do a lot of learning constantly from everyone, um, YouTube videos, other farmers in the area, and there's really a lot to it. To, to do it well, which I hope to one day do it well. The local community is great. We, it's, I used to be in construction in my former life, and the difference between construction and farming is the farmers are very willing to share everything. Um, they tell you everything you want to know, basically. Where uh, It was unusual for me because in construction, people were very secretive about their prices and how much stuff costs to do, and farming, the information is readily available, um, and most people are willing to share it with you. And why did you make the switch? I always wanted to have a small farm. I'm from Long Island originally, and I came up here to start a farm 20 something years ago. I finally got the opportunity to do it, so I gave it a try, and it worked pretty well. And why farming? I grew up with large gardens and chickens, and on Long Island, that was odder than it is up here. Um, and it was something I always loved, and it um, just resonated with me. So I always had large gardens and then larger gardens. And it's really wonderful that you're here. Thank Everybody you. is so thankful. We have local farmers. Well, it's it's this is a great local community. I mean, we couldn't do it without the community. I keep saying people always thank me for farming, but I say you know without the community, I would just be a crazy guy with a really expensive farming hobby. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for letting us visit you oh, on the farm. My pleasure.